Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I have with me today, Dr. Tamara Cushion, who's going to speak with us about the cost sharing programs and, for, and taxes for landowners. And so before I turn it over to her, I wanna do a little housekeeping. You're able to enter your questions into the Q&A box at any time during this presentation. Tamara will try her best to answer as many as possible while we're together. If it becomes too many and she just can't, she will, we will get her the questions and we will follow up after the presentation. This uh, session is being recorded and the recording and this slide deck will be sent out to all the registrants. In about two weeks, it will also be posted to farmers taxes. And so with that, Tamara, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Janet. So welcome everyone. Uh, today, we're going to talk about cost sharing programs uh, that are predominantly related to forestry. Uh, some of these have some overlap uh, for agricultural producers. Uh, I am not uh, necessarily versed very well in the agricultural side of things. I am a forester. Uh, I work here at the University of For uh, Florida in the School of Forest, Fisheries, and Geomatic Sciences. And so today, we'll be focusing on the programs uh, specific programs related that forestry can use, but we'll also talk about what these programs are, some of the uh, requirements when you are, are looking for the programs. And then of course, uh, the meat, not the meat of it necessarily, but the end of it here, we'll talk about uh, how they're treated for tax purposes. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So the agenda today, just to kind of give you a roadmap where we're going, talk about what cost share is. Uh, we'll discuss the federal programs. That's not to say that there aren't state programs, but with this being a national webinar, we're going to focus just on the ones that are federal and then realize that some of the states have taken federal dollars and uh, used them for different state level programs. And you should check uh, in your state to see what programs might be available for you. Uh, we'll talk about how to sign you up, uh, how you get involved in these cost share programs. We'll talk about where the funding comes from, because I think it's kind of important to know where the funding comes from in this um, and uh, and kind of the status on some of that, because there are some status issues. And then, of course, the tax implications. All right. So first off, um, cost share programs are part of this bigger picture that uh, wraps up under what we call landowner assistance. And this would be the same within agriculture and forestry. But landowner assistance um, is when we have technical and financial assistance is being provided by a form of government agency. It almost always starts at the federal level, even the state level programs, those dollars originate kind of at the federal level. And then you'll see some designation down to the states and then the states uh, may actually have their own kind of technical or financial assistance programs. that are very similar, but they may be very, very targeted versus what comes from the federal level. So on the technical side, what you tend to see is the ability to go to the agencies through these programs and get technical assistance, learn about uh, the resource that you have, maybe get an assessment of the resource in some cases, uh, and it may include help writing a forest management plan, or sometimes we'll hear it called a conservation plan or a stewardship plan. That's a really, really valuable form of assistance for a lot of folks. The state agencies will do some of these plans, uh, and they tend to get kind of backlogged. And so what we'll see is these uh, federal programs have another set of providers that are using federal dollars to, to fund these providers who can actually write these plans. And so that's where you might see a consulting forester who will write you a plan under for a reduced amount under some of these programs because they're getting this um, funding provided to them on your behalf. Uh, the other end of this is the part that uh, can be the most exciting part for some folks, and it's the financial assistance part of that. Um, and usually this is done on a per acre basis or on a uh, per operation basis. Uh, and there usually is a schedule that dictates what that amount will be. And that amount is usually determined based on kind of regional averages. So again, that government agency in a lot of cases is going to be coming through like the Farm Services Agency, the Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, are the two big ones that we'll talk about here today. 
So if we look at kind of what these uh, federal assistance uh, programs look like, and we're going to focus today on the financial part of it, uh, that's what we call cost share, right? And so cost share in most case, cases uh, implies that you are sharing the cost um, versus just outright assistance. And so what you'll have happen is you spend $100 on an operation uh, and your financial assistance in the form of cost share will be set at uh, the average uh, in the area, which is maybe $80. And so the cost share is that they pay 80, you pay 20 uh, in the form of a reimbursement. So federal cost share programs are authorized by the Farm Bill. And these have been in place for a long time, so almost 100 years now, uh, to help the farm economy. That's really where they started was in farming, and it has then moved over into a lot of our natural resource areas with the original intent to protect and sustain America's vital natural resources. So if you think about, you know, back in those days, a lot of the concerns were about soil health. Um, drought issues and pending problems related to drought and soils, uh, air quality. And so all these things that we were concerned about is why some of these agencies were established and then why we see funds put into these agencies to help farmers uh, accomplish these goals for the agencies. So it's because it's in the Farm Bill, the Farm Bill is reauthorized every five years. With that said, we are currently operating in 2024 under the 2018 Farm Bill. So the in theory, we would have had a new Farm Bill at this point. Uh, we are currently an operating under an extension on the Farm Bill. That is something that is being worked on. Um, I don't believe last time I heard was the expectation that we would have a completed Farm Bill by 2024. There's a lot of um, discussions that go into getting that farm bill put in place. I'll call your attention to the graphic with this, the percentages in it. Um, the reason why these farm bills can be really complicated and take a lot of time is there's a lot of interests at play, a lot of uh, different industries within natural resources and agriculture, each trying to get a little piece of the pie. The pie doesn't always expand. You can see here in the graph from 2008 to 2023, um, what's happening within the allocation. And so the number itself tends not to go up a whole lot because there's a limited amount of the pie to go around, but the fighting is happening within that pie. Um, nutrition is always the largest component of the farm bill. And the nutrition component of it uh, often entails the um, what used to be called WIC, uh, the Women, Infants and Children's, um, the uh, what used to be food stamps, right? The those kind of programs that's all entailed in that nutrition part of it, and so obviously that's a very very large component. And then you see the farm commodities, the crop insurance and conservation. And if we just ignore that nutrition part for a minute, you can see that the percentage of the total farm bill funding that is shared by farm crop and conservation has stayed fairly flat. Any changes are actually going. Um, to the uh, nutrition part of it. And we don't expect to see that change a lot. And so what that means is farm crop and conservation are fighting for an increasingly smaller part of that pie every time they go into those conversations. That's why it takes so long. It also, uh, it's something that they can extend uh, when they're dealing with other issues. Um, so we expect to see this uh, hopefully get um, worked on in the near future. So when we talk about the federal cost share programs that we see that would impact uh, forest landowners and those who have forest land on their property, there are three main programs. Historically, there have been some other ones. Uh, we've seen action to roll those into, uh, into, into bigger programs. So the first one is a conservation reserve program, uh, the environmental quality incentive program, otherwise known as EQIP. Uh, and then the conservation stewardship program. Now I'm gonna talk about each of these individually. There's a lot of similarities in these programs. In fact, sometimes you can't necessarily tell the difference between them. Um, and it's really gonna have to do with the particular practice that you're working on, uh, which program you're gonna fall under. Some of them are very incentive heavy where they're looking to uh, improve very specific resource, 
or maybe a specific species that the focus is on. And so that's going to push you towards one program or away from that program if what you're trying to do doesn't fall within that species conservation. Uh, I mentioned some programs that have gone away in the past. We had a wildlife habitat improvement program called WIP. That program uh, was folded into EQIP uh, just a few years back. And so if you're familiar with some of those programs, we've seen names change. Uh, conservation Reserve Program has been around. CRP has been around for a long time. But how it has uh, played out changes a little bit. Uh, but that's probably the truest one to what I remember hearing about years ago. So let's talk about the Conservation Reserve Program. This program is administered through the Farm Services Agency, um, and it involves a yearly rental payment. And that payment is going to change depending on um, your particular region of the country and the types of practices that are being done. The goal of the Conservation Reserve Program is to reserve, uh, remove some of these environmentally sensitive lands that are out there that are currently in some kind of crop, uh, cover crop, and move them over to something like forestry. And so uh, what you see with that tends to be, uh, in, in the CRP program, this twofold kind of program. You get a yearly rental payment that is trying to um, pull you away from doing production, uh, ag production, and then a um, cost share payment, if you will, uh, for some people that would allow them to do specific practices on your property. So you may only have the yearly rental, but if you're in CRP, you're going to have the yearly rental and you may have cost share as well. These these programs you go into, you have a contract. So you go to them, uh, you agree to certain things, uh, including some monitoring. And these contracts are 10 to 15 years in length. So I want to call your attention to kind of the goals of this program are to reestablish valuable land cover to improve water quality, prevent soil erosion, and reduce loss of wildlife habitat. So you can see kind of based on that language there, the kinds of operations they want to move folks away from and what they're trying to move people into is these practices um, that are going to enhance um, those, those water quality, soil erosion, and uh, wildlife habitat qualities. The next one up is this uh, EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. This one is administered through the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, it's had some different names in the past. This uh, organization has been around for a long time. Uh, what they do in the realm of this EQIP program is to provide some assistance with development of a conservation plan. So those of you in, uh, that are familiar with forestry and, and maybe a forest management plan, uh, I want to make it clear that what's happening in these conservation plans is not your typical timber management plan, which might have dollar values and it might talk about, um, you know, what's out there right now and kind of tell you what it's worth, what it would be worth at the time of a harvest. These conservation plans really are going to focus more on the resource itself. Uh, do an assessment of what's out there, uh, what's water quality like, what's the soil um, type of qualities, and making sure that we're focusing on these uh, issues that the NRCS is really trying to focus on. So part of this development of plan is also to solve some on-farm resource issues. So if there's um, some issues with declining soil health or water quality degradation, they're going to really focus on how can we improve those issues? What are we going to do? What practices are we going to put in place? And it's really this kind of conversation between the landowner and the professionals that work in NRCS to decide what are the issues, what do we see as professionals, what do you see as a landowner, and what practices can you put in place, uh, maybe with some financial assistance to try to improve the qualities. So these qualities that they're usually looking at are the water, the air, soil, and in, in some cases, wildlife related. So if you're trying to solve a very specific wildlife related problem or um, create habitat or improve habitat for a specific species, that's going to really appeal to this type of a program, this EQIP. Remember that EQIP previously uh, also had WIP. So WIP was out separate. Now WIP is the wildlife program is rolled into that. And so you are going to see some very wildlife habitat uh, focused pro uh, programs in here. 
Uh, I see somebody's asking about the Northern Bob White uh, and what's needed to qualify. Um, I'm not going to go specific. I, I am Southerner. Uh, I'm located here in the South. So I'm going to point you to the NRCS website page. And I'd encourage you, if you're interested in specific programs within specific incentives, to uh, look at the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, and then it will list, and then there's separate web pages for each of these initiatives. So um, EQIP, in addition to the technical assistance, is going to be able to provide you some financial assistance to do uh, practices that will contribute to the improvement of those um, resources on property. So some of the targeted programs uh, here in the South, we have one on, we have a longleaf pine and sun initiative, uh, trying to improve the amount of acres uh, or increase the number of acres that are planted in longleaf pine and improve the quality of the longleaf pine uh, forest that we have, mainly because that is uh, some of the, our endangered species are located on those longleaf pine forests. Uh, we have, there is one for that Northern Bob White quail. Uh, again, I'd encourage you to go look up the specifics of these programs. Uh, it'll tell you the regions that these programs are in play, and then the kinds of practices that they might be looking for uh, to qualify. There's also Great Lakes Restoration Program, uh, a Mississippi River Basin Healthy Watershed Initiative. So these are just a handful. Uh, they're all over the country, but they're very specific to the issues uh, and the species that you're going to find in that area. There's some sage grouse ones. Um, and so if you are in certain areas of the country and you know that there are uh, problems that that area faces or species that um, are a special concern or endangered species, then search those out and see what programs are available to you. I'd also tell you that if you show up at the NRCS office and talk to the folks working there, they're going to be informed about the types of programs and the initiatives that are in play in the area of your country that might be um, really targeted to the types of properties that you have. So apologize for not being specific on each of those, but those could probably each take up quite a bit of webinar time. Um, and I'm just frankly not qualified to talk about some species. So the final program I want to highlight for you at a federal level is called the Conservation Stewardship Program, CSP. It is also administered through the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, it has technical assistance available for you, um, as well as these annual payments for implementation of conservation practices. The CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program, and EQIP, um, sound very, very similar. And again, uh, a lot of the differentiation is going to be what's available in your area and what practices are important to them. I would say conservation stewardship is probably more general than you will see with EQIP now that EQIP has uh, got a lot of initiatives in it. Uh, previously, EQIP did not have a lot of special initiatives uh, for regions of the country based on uh, very specific species. Now that they have a uh, CSP is going to be probably your more general program uh, for landowners that are just trying to do conservation practices that would improve water, air, and soil uh, qualities. A lot of these, um, I won't say don't apply to plantations. They they do and can very much be used in plantations. Um, they are going to want to see, though, how you're um, utilizing those dollars to go beyond just uh, improving your plantation, right? And so we're really trying to uh, enhance what's out there towards conservation purposes. So how do I get cost share? There's, there's multiple programs and some of them have very specific requirements. The more detailed programs, those initiatives probably have more specific uh, requirements as you go into them. But there are some general things that we can say about all cost share programs and what they're going to require. So first off, they are all going to require some kind of uh, management plan. Uh, as a forester, I would highly recommend it, even if you're not after conservation uh, cost share dollars, is to have some kind of a management plan or conservation plan or stewardship plan, whether it's one that is freely provided through technical assistance programs, or if you've actually paid uh, a consulting forester to do one for you. There are also some templates out there that are running through some of the other organizations, extension 
uh, in some states has some program, uh, some templates available for management plans that are going to look a lot like those NRCS templates. Um, most of these programs are going to require it when you walk in the door, mainly because they want to know that the dollars that are being used are have been the program and your operations have been thought through, that this isn't just uh, something you're deciding to do today, but because they're going to require accountability on it, that management plan is going to show that you've kind of thought through, that you've taken account of the resources that are currently out there and thought through what your objectives are for the property and, and that these uh, operations or practices that you're going to put in place are going to help you get from point A to point B. When you walk in with that management plan, you're going to have a visit with a forester or other natural resource professional that is hired by the agency to talk about whether uh, this is going to meet the agency's goals, whether it's going to meet the um, the goals of the particular program that you're applying for, and actually whether it's going to meet your goals. Uh, I had a landowner in one state who um, went and talked to one of the agencies. Um, and then when we talked to him a little bit later, the, the program he was signing up for that he's about to sign a contract for, while it was going to give him some financial assistance, it really wasn't going to be the best thing for his property uh, in the immediate future. We think down the line it could work for him. He had some work to do um, and needed to do it in stages, and um, the, the program was going to require him to do it uh, faster than we felt like was the right path for him after talking to him with his objectives. So you're going to talk to that forester about your objectives um, and make sure that the program is going to meet what you want uh, and that you're comfortable getting into a contract because it is a contract. It is going to be enforceable. Um, these management plans cost money if you go get it produced by a consulting forester. Um, if you go through your state agency, uh, usually they are of no cost, or I would say very low cost if there's some requirement. The downside with the no to low cost ones, there usually is a waiting list. Um, just due to state resources, they may not have a uh, ability to just crank out a management plan for you uh, when you walk in the door within the next week. Um, so it may take uh, a little while to get that done. And that, that's very dependent on the resources within your state. Um, I think I'm going to get back to that question in a minute. So I did see it, but I will get back to it. Um, so the next thing you're going to need to do is you're going to have to complete an application. So you've got to have the management plan, but then you're going to complete the application. So this is an example of what a plan, uh, a application form looks like for NRCS for the conservation, one of the conservation programs. Uh, a lot of it's just kind of standard information. Um, but you're going to see it starts asking some very specific questions. So one of the first questions is whether you have uh, a, a customer record with the Farm Service Agency. And if you don't, it's going to ask you to go ahead and do that. So a lot of this um, can be problematic for some landowners. So it's why I want to tell you all about these things ahead of time. Make sure that you um, have the appropriate documentation on ownership uh, and and you have that kind of tax lot information because in order to give you government funds, there is some accountability required. Uh, first off, taxpayers want to know where their money is going. And so the agency is responsible to the taxpayers for use of funds, but also uh, individual landowners are going to be accountable for how they're using those funds back to the agency. So they're going to ask you uh, about this farm service agency record. This is a big one. You have to be able to show that you have the right to do what you want to do on this particular property. And that sounds kind of silly, um, but it's actually not. Um, it, there are people that will take government money and do things on property that they have no right to do anything on. And so this is going to make sure that you either own the property or you have permission through a written lease agreement to do something on that property. Because again, you're doing this through a contract and the contract is setting up both sides, both parties of the contract for obligations. So there are things that you're gonna be responsible for doing. And so to make sure that you can hold up that end of the deal, they're gonna require proof of ownership. 
Where this becomes uh, a little bit more challenging is in the instance of air property. And that is something that's uh, a pretty big issue here in the South, maybe not so much in other parts of the country. But um, having clear title, having actual proof, even if you are one of the owners. And so I'd encourage you to make sure that you have some form of proof of ownership. Um, and if there's questions about that, or if you are indeed an air property owner and you do not have clear title, there are resources available to uh, work through that process of getting title cleared, but also to meet with the agency to discuss what you can do in the meantime uh, to provide proof of your ability to get into these contracts if you do not have clear title. Uh, again, that's a really complicated topic. And so I'm going to leave it there, but I'd encourage you if you need some assistance to kind of reach out, I'd be happy to talk to you some more or to point you to the direction of some folks who are more versed in the, the legalities of that air property question. I'm going to check real quick where we're at on questions. Do you need to reapply each year? Um, that's going to depend on which particular program you're in and the contract length. So it's really dependent on that contract. If you're in one of these longer contracts, like the 10 to 15 year contract, you don't need to reapply every year. Uh, if it's a one time I get cash uh, for a particular practice for that year and I want another, um, if I wanna go into the next program the next year, then yeah, you're gonna have to reapply. So um, again, very specific to the program. Sorry to be vague on that, but it really just depends I hate saying it depends on a webinar, but it really does. So when you go into these offices, any of these, um, you're going to need to bring some things with you. You have to have some proof of your official tax ID. Uh, this is going to be uh, your individual social security number, if it's you as an individual, or if it's a part of an entity, you need some kind of employer ID, um, something to show that you, again, can take government money. Uh, again, bring with you, not only have you checked the box showing that you have a property deed or a lease agreement, bring it with you, um, or some other documentation showing you have uh, control of the property. Uh, again, with that heirs property, this is going to be the challenging part of it um, to get that. And, and you want to connect to resources that are specifically set up for that. And that's uh, an increasing number of folks in the, this point. Uh, if you're going into the uh, farm services agency, you need to bring with you your farm track number. Uh, again, it's something you want to do all this ahead of time. The sooner you can do this, the better. A lot of times they announce that funding is available and uh, the turnaround can be kind of quick. If you learn that that window opens tomorrow, um, some of those uh, in some places, the money goes fast and the money goes fast because the money is being shared among farmers forest landowners and ranchers, because some of these programs are not specific to a farmer or a forest landowner or a rancher. And so because of that, you could have a lot of people going after those dollars, or in some cases, only a few people going after those dollars. So you want to be ready and you want to be on the lookout for those dollars to, uh, to be announced. Uh, it does not hurt to go into these offices now, ask questions, make sure you understand so that you'll be ready when it becomes available. So uh, once you've gone in the office and you filled out the application, you have a management plan, the waiting game begins. Uh, so if it's NRCS or FSA, they're going to evaluate and rank the applications. And so they have a group of people that will go through each of those. Again, uh, in some places, there's money left over at the end. And so that process goes pretty quick on the evaluation, the ranking, because there's not a lot of folks uh, in that pool. Uh, in other places, especially where there's a lot of individual owners, this is going to be a lot of applications that they're going through and trying to rank. Once they've gone through the ranking and evaluation process, they'll go through and they'll notify uh, those that they are issuing cost share dollars to and uh, have the contract drafted up uh, for both parties uh, to sign. And then from there, you'll move into the stage of going ahead and implementing the practice. And then in a lot of cases, there is monitoring afterwards to make sure that you're holding up your end of the bargain, that you are doing what you said you were going to do uh, within that contract. And then, of course, I, I should say that should you not do 
what you said you were going to do within that contract, there are going to be penalties, especially if you've taken money to do it and have not followed through. Uh, of course, I, 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 I believe that if you there were some extenuating circumstances that you need to uh, notify them soon uh, at, as those um, extenuating circumstances come up and get in a conversation with it, uh, with that agency about what's going on. Again, it, it's competitive. Uh, I, I want you to see kind of what's going on here, the actual dollars, the projected dollars. Um, it's competitive between forest landowners um, because there's only so many dollars allocated to an area. Again, it's coming from federal down to state. In some cases, it's down to the county level where these are being issued. And then even between programs, uh, if it's not separated out how they're doing it, um, then it's going to be competitive between the different resources. So uh, that you can see the bottom of the green is our working land programs. These are the ones that we've talked about today. Uh, EQIP, you see, is an increasing amount, increasing percentage of dollars going to things like equip and conservation stewardship. Uh, conservation reserve program used to be a huge chunk of the dollars uh, back in the late 90s, and you see that it is a much smaller part. That means if you're trying to get into CRP now, there's a lot more competition for those dollars because it is a smaller percentage of the entire pot now. So just to give you kind of a scope of the funding of these programs, uh, in the last reported year, 2023, Conservation Reserve Program, $1.77 billion uh, invested in the Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, it funded 24.8 million acres. Now, when I say that, you know, some acres have a much smaller touch. Other acres were taking a lot, a lot more dollars because of the types of practices they're doing. So certainly not evenly distributed. Uh, that program is, however, capped at 27 million acres. So once they meet that cap, that's the maximum uh, number of acres that are gonna be enrolled in the program. Of course, um, it doesn't appear that last year that they reached that cap. And so I wouldn't expect to see that cap expanded when all the acres aren't uh, fully utilized. If we start seeing them bumping up against that cap year after year, then there obviously would be a push to expand that. The Conservation Stewardship Program, CSP, um, uh, was funded at up to $1 billion in 2023. So you see those programs, um, you know, almost two to one. And then EQIP, we see a significantly higher amount of dollars invested in the EQIP program, uh, $2.025 billion in 2023. So a lot of money at stake. So let's move from what the programs are, um, how to get them, and talk about how these things wrap into uh, your tax return. So when we talk about taxes and we talk about income, it's pretty much assumed from the get-go that any income received uh, from any source is going to be taxable unless you can find some provision within the tax code that specifically excludes it. Uh, and so with the case of cost share payments, we do see a code provision that allows us to exclude part or all of these cost share uh, payments. And so that code section, for those of you that are interested, is code section 126. Um, most tax preparers should have at least some familiar familiarity with that tax provision. Um, and so, again, um, this is going to allow you, through a calculation, to exclude part or all of the payment. But you will have to do some calculation to determine how much would be eligible for exclusion. You can also choose to include it in taxable income. Some folks do that because they're trying to meet certain thresholds for other provisions of their income tax. So some rules regarding your eligibility to exclude those cost share payments. The payment that you receive, receive for cost share has to be for a capital expenditure. So if you received cost share funds to uh, spray and herbicide, you can deduct that anyway. And so that means that if you got those cost share dollars for an herbicide, you're going to need to include that cost share payment in your um, 
income and then you'll take the expense off for using the herbicide. So it's just showing up in two different parts of your tax return, but ultimately ending up at, at, at that same place. Um, if you have done something uh, like put in um, some major structure that's going to improve your road system to stop siltation into the streams to improve water quality, that would be something that I would consider a capital expenditure. That capital expenditure normally would be something you would capitalize. And so you're going to uh, take that cost share from that. You'll do that formula that I'll show you in a minute. Um, you can elect to exclude all or part of that payment for that capital expenditure. It has to come from an approved agency. The agencies we've talked about today are those approved agencies. Uh, and it has to be for conservation purposes. So uh, you putting an office building in, if, if you could actually get funded for that, would not be one of those kind of cost share programs uh, payments that we would be able to exclude. And so it has to be something that is deemed to be for conservation purposes. So if we start talking about how we figure out what that excludable amount is, I'm going to read directly from the code for a second. Um, the present fair market value of the right to receive annual income from the affected acreage of the greater of 10% of the prior average annual income from the affected acreage or $2.50 times the number of affected acres. That's that's awful. It's a hard thing to read. It's a hard thing to understand when you read it that way. Um, and so just know that it's cryptic, um, but it's really not as bad as it sounds. Let me show you kind of what this boils down to. When we try to talk about excluding cost share, we are looking at the greater of 10% of your average annual income for the three tax years immediately prior. So what happened in those last three tax years um, on that property? or the amount equal to $2.50 per acre times the number of acres that you got cost share uh, payment for. So let, let's be really clear. If you didn't have a harvest, that top bullet doesn't exist, right? It's zero. So 10% uh, of zero averaged over three years is still zero. Uh, and we're looking for the greater of, so you're gonna be multiplying $2.50 times the number of acres treated. And then we're gonna be looking for an interest rate from the farm credit bank in your region. So let's let's look at this a little bit. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples here in a minute. So a couple of limitations again, if you can ex if you can deduct it in the year that you incur the expense, then you can't exclude the cost share part. Um, if you got cost share dollars to do reforestation expenses, there's a code provision that allows you to uh, take off most of your reforestation expenses, either uh, in the first year, immediately deduct up to $10,000 in reforestation expenses, uh, and then anything above that amount you could uh, write off over the next 84 months. If you choose to use that incentive, then you have to include the cost share payment that you received um, to do reforestation work. Basically, we're trying to stop double dipping, right? So you have to pay it in one hand and take it off in another, but you can't take it off twice and only pay it once. Okay. So let's look at uh, a little bit of this, uh, kind of a little bit more graphic of what I was saying. So step one, we're going to look at the, uh, the average annual income for the past year, uh, sorry, the past three years, average that multiply by 10%, and then you're going to multiply the 250 times the number of acres. Take the bigger number in step three of the of step one and step two and divide that by that interest rate. And then we're going to compare step three's answer to whatever that cost share payment was that you received. The smaller amount is what's going to be excluded. Okay. So let's look at some numbers because I think it'll be way clearer once we see some numbers on this. Example, Mr. Thomas received $6,000 from uh, the Conservation Reserve Program cost share for qualified capital expenditures on 100 acres of timberland. If he had no income from the property in the last three years, how much could he exclude? All right. So step one, 10% times zero is still zero. So there's no income in the last three years, nothing to average. So it's zero. So we're going to multiply $2.50 times the 100 acres uh, that were treated and have $250. Step three, 
I only have one number in the first two steps. So two to $150 divided by that farm credit bank interest rate of 5.09%. That gives me an answer of $4,912. Now I'm gonna compare that $4,912 to the $6,000 that he actually received in cost share dollars. The smaller amount is what you're going to be able to exclude. So he's gonna be able to exclude $4,912. All right, so what if that same landowner actually had some timber harvests in the past three years? We're gonna take 10% times the three-year average of that timber harvest. So $9,600 divided by three times 10% is $320. We're also gonna do step two again, come up with $250. We're gonna take the larger of those two, of step one and step two. And that's the, the calculation of that timber sale average 10%. So $320 in step three divided by the interest rate again gives me $6,287. I'm gonna take that number and I'm gonna compare that $6,287 to the actual cost share amount that he received. He received $6,000. So he can actually exclude the entirety of that $6,000. So now that you know how to calculate it, um, what you need to do when you decide how much you're excluding, you need to include a statement showing the total cost of the operation. So it costs me um, X amount of dollars to do the road work I did. Um, how much cost share did you receive for it? That's that $6,000 that he spent. So uh, $6,000 that he received for cost share. Uh, when was it received? This is important because we're talking about which tax year that this is going to be uh, uh, eligible for cost share treatment. So we got to know which year you received the money. Uh, what was the purpose of the payment? This is really just writing a statement. What did you get the money for? It was for conservation of the soil resources. It was to prevent uh, additional siltation in the streams. It was to improve wildlife habitat for sage grouse, whatever you were doing it for. That's gonna really be probably in your contract if it's not just part of the program in the first place. Uh, the amount that you excluded from income and then how you determined it. That's where I would have on a piece of paper that calculation and, and you're gonna have that amount written down and show how that was done. All right, so a lot of times when we have the ability to do something, um, it's there's a reason that we've been given the ability to exclude those dollars. Um, and so if you were to then sell the property, um, there is something called recapture that will come about. So if you establish the property, if you do something on it major with those dollars and you exclude the cost share payment and then you sell the property, within 20 years, there's gonna be recapture provisions. And so what that means is there's gonna be some interest and some penalties on the tax benefits that you received. I'd point you to uh, Internal Revenue Code Section 1255 for details on that uh, to understand, but it's just something to keep in mind that when you use some of these provisions in the Federal Income Tax Code, that when you dispose of the property, um, they do reach back at some of the tax benefit that you received. And, and put a penalty on it. All right, so making the decision to, I said, you know, it is a decision. Uh, automatically, it's supposed to be excluded once you do the formula, um, but you could choose to include it. How you make that decision has some pretty big ramifications, right? It's gonna be uh, impacting your federal income tax, but if you're in a state that has a state income tax, that could have impacts on that. Um, and it might also affect your self-employment tax, right? Because it is income that is being brought in that is outside of your wage income. So you need to think about whether you have income on the property in the past three years, because that's going to obviously affect that calculation. Are you going to hold the property for a long, long period of time, right? I've told you that within 20 years, uh, you're going to have some recapture if you sell it. So you need to kind of figure that out and see if there's any uh, grading of, you know, like if I held it 15 years, the penalty is not as heavy as if you uh, sell it within the first couple of years. You need to think about your income tax bracket because including it or excluding it could matter depending on what your tax bracket is in a particular year. 
Um, and then again, think about what your state income taxes are and how that's going to have an impact there. So I'll go back and hit some of these questions real quick. I'm going to try. Um, one of the statements in here was about have CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program, including pollinators. I'll be honest with you, I, I'm not clear if pollinators are included in that. I'm, I, I apologize for not knowing that. Um, so um, in Virginia, we have thousands of landowners whose lands are besieged by invasive plants, need financial help to deal with the problem. They would like to use EQIP, but it doesn't work for them because it's competitive applications only deal with invasive plants, don't score enough points to obtain an award. To get an award here, you have to have many different, uh, sorry, I just lost it, many different practices included in the application. He suggests how these landowners can obtain assistance. Is there any consideration being given to having a funding pool specifically for this problem? So uh, I'll talk about that last part first about whether consideration for a special funding pool. Um, I have not heard anything along having a special funding pool within those, but I will tell you that, um, you know, continue to give feedback to uh, your local office. A lot of times what's happening is at the state and local levels, they are able to prioritize the issues that are most important for them, right? So if you're in an area where this uh, particular invasive species is one of the biggest problems you have, then the, the people that set up the programs locally have the ability to kind of prioritize applications that look that way. And so I would continue to make noise about that if that's an issue. And a lot of places I know have invasive species issues. There's also um, thinking about doing other operations on the property that would qualify. Again, just kind of piecing things together. Uh, there are other creative ways to deal with um, removing invasive species. And I'd encourage you to look at organizations that help, even though it may not be financial, it might be um, just manual that people come out and help do that. I've heard of work parties to remove it. I've heard of uh, landowner organizations that kind of pool together the resources to do it on multiple properties. Um, so kind of a cooperative approach, if you will. So I'd encourage you to kind of think outside the box on this. Sometimes it's hard to move these programs, especially when um, it's a minority of people um, that are concerned about it. Um, private force lander with uh, EFRP, I'm scared to try to say that emergency Forest Restoration Program, I believe is what it is. How does our, does our cost share reimbursement count as taxable income? If we are paying contracts, should it just be a reimbursement on cost and not in income? Um, I would ask you to send me uh, an email on that one, and I'd be happy to look into that program a little bit more. Uh, there's something different about that program, and I don't want to misspeak here, um, but I have looked at it, and I just cannot remember what I found when I looked at it. So if you will uh, send me an email, uh, my email's on the screen. Uh, I'd be happy to look into that for you and make sure I understand what you're looking for. We have won a grant for fuels reduction work for 62 acres. The money is passed from USDA to me and then to the contractor doing the work. I gain no money. How will the taxes be handled? And so a lot of times what's happening, even though you think there's no gain, you still have to go through this process and run that, run that calculation, right? And so when you take in money, right, when you get that grant, that cost share money, um, especially if it is a, one of these cost share programs that's eligible for exclusion, you still have to do that calculation. That calculation may find out that you have to include some of that income. And then, of course, you would separately somewhere else, depending on your filing status. And by filing status, I mean, are you a business or are you an investor? Um, that's going to dictate where and whether you can deduct the expenses associated with hiring the contractor. So for instance, if what I was doing um, was in the category of being a hobby, then I would not be able to deduct the expenses associated with doing the work on the property because I was categorized as a hobby. If you're a business, you can pay to have those things done. And it's just a question of where does that come off your tax return? Uh, same with as an investor, there are specific places these things are come, come down. And so long story short, 
your income from this money is going in one place and it's going to count as ordinary income, the expense may have to be capitalized because of what you're doing, um, because you're ineligible to expense it at the current time. So that's a complicated question. Uh, and uh, I did my best to give you a um, somewhat simple answer on that. Uh, if a landowner had an assignment of payment directly to the contractor carrying out the work, would they still be taxed as taxable income? Or would that taxable income go straight to the contractor? So you are signing the contract with the agency. So you are the one getting the funding, even if it's paid on your behalf to the contractor. Best I understand it. So if if you are the one who's getting the money, even if you never touch it, uh, that would be taxable income to you um, from a tax perspective. Now, I'd be happy to look at uh, any paperwork to say, oh, the way that transaction is structured is different. Um, we talk about this with landowners regarding like timber sale income. Uh, some landowners, um, the mill will cut the check separately to the logger and separately to the landowner, but the landowner still um, paid the logger, right? They just didn't actually write the check. And so it's really looking at the transaction and seeing what's really happening versus what's a convenience. So uh, Cody, if if you want me to look at kind of language and understand exactly the circumstances, be happy to look at that for you. But at the end of the day, uh, if you have signed the contract, uh, then in my book, you are getting the income for it and they're gonna report that to the IRS. The easiest way to know this is if you actually get something saying that you received those dollars uh, from the agency. All right, so I just wanna make sure I got anything else. All right, well, not seeing any other questions. I wanna thank you all for coming today. Uh, you have my email if you have further questions on uh, cost share programs and tax treatment of them. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have a farm bill soon with some more information going forward. So uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Janet. Thank you, Tamara. And we appreciate all of the information you gave us today. We are able to have Tamara and um, other experts like her with us through a cooperative agreement with the National Farm Income Tax Extension Committee. And we will continue to have these um, these webinars monthly. If you are signed up with, on, with Gov Delivery through USDA, you will get a heads up of when these um, when these webinars are coming and the um, ability to register. In the uh, webinar chat, I dropped a couple of links. Tamara talked about, um, for those of you who have not worked with USDA before, the items that you need to bring in. And I dropped a link to a two-pager that kind of outlines what you need to bring and what you can expect. Um, on farmers.gov, there is also a page devoted to forest landowners. So you can find some information there on um, disaster assistance and on conservation and um, um, loans that are specific to forest landowners. And um, there were some questions that may have been maybe more program specific. Um, if you, um, as those come in, Tamara, if they come in to you, you can send them to me and I will pass them on to the specialist on my end that could get those questions answered. And so with that, seems like the Q&A um, queue is clear. And so again, I'll thank you everyone for joining us and we will sign off until next month with our, um, with the next topic that we will have on hand. Um, everyone have a great day. <laughs>